Hey everyone, in this episode, let's add some simple interactivity to our entities with Unity Physics, the physics framework created for dots. Those of you familiar with classic Unity know that adding collision or trigger events is fundamental to gameplay scripting. If you want your player spaceship to pick up a collectible, or if you want it to crash into another entity, we need collisions or triggers. In DOTS physics, setting these up is quite a bit different than how we do it with traditional mono behaviors. Like everything else in DOTS, there's a slight learning curve, so let's investigate. Use the starter project from the link in the description. In addition to the universal render pipeline, entities, and hybrid renderer, we need the Unity physics package. Because of compatibility, we've downgraded the entities and hybrid renderer from the previous episode. If you're using different package versions in the future, just remember to double check your dependencies for each one. A single check mark next to the word installed means that's good. You're using the same version available when the package was released. A version number next to the check mark indicates that you have the package installed, but you're using a different version. It might be fine, but look out for any errors or warnings in the console. If you see a red exclamation point next to the package version, then you have a compatibility issue, your project won't compile, so you need to resolve that before moving on. Unity physics is a large subject and we'll only gloss over it here. We'll cover more aspects of DOTS physics in the full version of this course. As always, just use the link in the description to sign up for the mailing list when it's available from gameacademy.school. Load up the simple physics scene from the starter project and you can see DOTS physics in action. The primitives on the left use classic Unity physics and the ones on the right use DOTS physics. They behave almost the same at runtime. The main difference is that DOTS physics gives you a bit more flexibility and performance. It was built for that in mind. The core features between the two physics frameworks do work about the same. If you look at a side-by-side -side comparison, you will see a lot of analogous components. Unity Dots Physics and Classic Unity Phys X. Instead of rigid bodies, we have a physics body authoring component in Dots, and at runtime, this mono behavior becomes a physics body component in ECS. Instead of box colliders and mesh colliders, we have a Dots Physics shape authoring component, and in play mode, this becomes a Dots Physics collider component. You can either add the new DOTS physics authoring components directly, as we'll see later, or you can use the old components and rely on the subscene conversion. Either way works. DOTS physics organizes its systems into distinct worlds. We can see that in the entity debugger in play mode. We now have extra systems and worlds in the left-hand column. As a developer, you can use these to your advantage, allowing you to hook into specific parts of the physics loop. In the build physics world, Physics entities from the editor undergo conversion and get prepped for simulation. In the step physics world, the actual physical simulation takes place. Here, Unity calculates translations and rotations based on forces and interactions. And finally, the results of the simulation are sent out into the exported physics world, and that's the end result that you see at runtime. Each stage in this process has a job handle, and there's also a catch-all end frame physics system as well. Again, this is architected for maximum flexibility. Unfortunately, that same flexibility does mean that setting up a simple collision or trigger event does involve more syntax than classic Unity. So let's walk you through a simple trigger example. Triggers are common behaviors for collectibles or any objects that a player might pick up during gameplay. An item could grant special abilities like health or extra firepower, for example. Let's use a trigger collider, replicating some logic that you would use to create something like that. Load up the trigger event scene from the starter project. To keep things simple, the asteroids and the chasers from the previous episodes have been culled, but they do exist as prefabs in the project. You could just add them back easily with a few drag and drops. In the models folder, there's a simple cube named item pickup. For our purposes, I just need some kind of box. Drag the item pickup model from the project into the hierarchy, and let's shift it off to the side somewhere. We'll make it spin to call attention to itself. Fortunately, we can just reuse the systems that we created for the asteroids in the other videos. Add a spinner tag and move data, drop those onto the game object, and they should turn into authoring components automatically. Set the turn speed to something small, just so that the collectible won't look so static. 
something like 0 0.5. And we need this to convert to an entity, so let's create a subscene out of it. New subscene from selection, and we'll call it pickup subscene or something like that. And let's save everything for good measure. File save. Check it in play mode to verify that it's spinning in place and terrific. It's always good to have some visual indicator to tell the player that the object in question is special. Once we have that, it's time for some physics. The item pickup game object will need some authoring components so that it gets physics at runtime. Let's add a physics body to it. And you can find that under dots, physics, physics body. This is the dots equivalent of a rigid body. It holds the physics settings for the individual entity, properties like mass, damping, and velocity. We're driving the motion of this entity using non-physics scripts. So I want to switch the motion type and select kinematic. It interacts with other physics objects, but we don't want physics to determine its motion. And that's just like classic Unity. In addition to the physics body, we can also add a physics shape authoring script as well. You can choose a primitive or mesh for the shape type, and then adjust any of these parameters to control its size, center, and orientation. Check is trigger. We don't want other physics objects to bounce off if they strike the pickup item. If is trigger is checked, physics entities like our player just pass through without affecting their movements. And note that physics shape is only an authoring component. At runtime, it turns into a physics collider, and that's the actual ECS component. Physics shape is just a mono behavior that undergoes conversion. One last thing that we can add is a debug script, and that will help you visualize some of the physics elements at runtime. You can find that under dots, physics, physics debug display, and we'll check colliders. As the name implies, this is just for debugging. You probably don't want to leave this active permanently. If I scoot the scene camera over to see our item pickup, in play mode, you'll see a small spinning box in the scene view, and that's the physics debug mode drawing our collider. The subscene is still in edit mode, and we see the static game object superimposed. So let me just uncheck edit mode to make those go away. And now much better. That's our spinning entity complete with trigger collider. Now, I've noticed that it does seem to cause some conflicts later. So maybe that's this particular build of the preview package, but we don't really need this. So let me just remove it for now. You can always just add it back later if you need to troubleshoot. The player's spaceship will need a collider as well. Edit the spaceship subscene, add a physics body and physics shape authoring script to our space fighter. And let's make this kinematic. We already have scripts to move the entity. In the physics shape, choose mesh for the shape type and select the space fighter mesh. And now we have a collider and a trigger ready to go in our scene. It's time to add some scripts. I need to mark this item pickup with a tag. So let's make an empty component for that purpose. Let's create a new tag from create ECS runtime component type. And we'll name that pickup tag or something similar. And we'll just set it up as a blank component data. Just clear this out and add a generate authoring component attribute. And there's our blank tag component. Add that to the item pickup game object with a quick drag and drop. And now we're ready for some game logic. And don't forget to save your scene and subscene. In order for our item pickup to respond to the player running over it, we need a system. Create a new ECS system. Create ECS system. And let's name it something descriptive like pickup on trigger system. Open that up in Visual Studio or your editor of choice. And then at the top, let's add a couple of using lines using unity.physics and using unity.physics.systems. This will give us an extra interface for use with our trigger. Unlike other systems that we've already written for our little mini game, we don't inherit from system base in this case. Instead, we're going to stick with the original job component system, which has a slightly more difficult syntax. Those of you who need a refresher for the C -sharp job system and job component system, just check out the links in the description. In the job component system, there's no special entities for each available for iterating over all of the entities in our scene. 
we do have the on update with the job handles exposed. So if you remember the procedure, we need to break our Jobified code into a separate struct, and that's this thing defined here. And then in the on update, we need to create a job, initialize that job with data, schedule the job, and then take care of any dependencies using the job handles. As of this recording, any part of Dots logic that gives you quote unquote more expert level control still uses this convention. Now the syntax is slightly more complex than using system base, but the one thing that is good about this is that it's more clear what each piece of the code does. So love it or hate it, here it goes. Instead of ijob for each, which is obsolete, we need our job struct to implement an interface called iTriggerEventsJob. This currently highlights in red because it uses an execute method with a different function signature. So let's just clear out the old execute and let the compiler fix that. I will implement the interface. And the execute method of the iTriggerEventsJob is a bit different in that it always has a special trigger event as an argument. We'll use that for our trigger logic later, but for now, let's just clear out this exception line and we'll come back to it. Down in the on update, we have another issue with scheduling the job. The function signature of the iTriggerEventsJob requires that you use this slightly differently. When you schedule, you need to pass in the dots physics simulation and build world. Now, before we set those up, let's just break this line so its intent is more clear when we schedule a job, we're getting a job handle back, and that's a thing that we're actually returning from on update. Now, I'll split out the job handle explicitly. That'll be handy later. And then we just return it at the bottom. Now, at the top, let's set up references to our physics worlds. Private, build physics world, build physics world. Private, step physics world, step physics world. Remember, one is where we're setting up the colliders and dynamic entities. The other is where we actually run the simulation. To populate those, we're going to use onCreate. Protected, override, void, onCreate. And then we'll use world, get or create system to set the appropriate world. So something like that. We just need to grab both of these physics worlds, the build world and the simulation world. And then we're going to use both of those down when we schedule. The first argument is the simulation. And we get that from step physics world dot simulation. And then we pass in build physics world dot physics world as the second argument. And that needs to be passed in by reference. So I'll use the ref keyword. And let me break this line so you can actually read it. That's generally how we're going to schedule a physics event. Simulation build physics world, followed by your previous job handle. In the trigger event, we want to test what types of physics entities have collided. And the easiest way to do that is to use component data from entity. We showed you that a while back. Inside of the trigger events job, let's declare a couple of those. Public component data from entity, pickup tag, and let's call that all pickups or pickup groups. This is a container of pickup tag components. And another one, public component data from entity, player tag. And even though we only have one player, this always returns a native container. So I'll call that all players. Now, because this is a job, you really should make both of these read only. They are native containers. And if you don't do that, no other jobs can have access to them unless you release ownership back to the main thread. Read only makes that a non-issue and safe to use at all times. Once we have those fields defined in the job, then you initialize them down in on update. Job dot all pickups equals get component data from entity, passing in pickup tag, and use true to indicate that yes, this is read only. And then just repeat that for the all players, job all players, get component data from entity, player tag, true. Once those are set up, then all the magic happens inside of the jobs execute method. Uni gives us this trigger event that contains references to the two physics entities that are colliding. Trigger event contains a property called entities that in turn contains an entity A and an entity B. And I'll just spell them out for you. Entity entity A equals trigger event dot entities dot entity A. So we have this property entities on the trigger event and this is the first entity or entity A. Similarly, we have an entity B 
entity entity B equals trigger event dot entities dot entity B. This trigger event runs every time that two physics entities touch and one of them is marked as trigger. In our case, that's the item pickup. It's possible that we do have two pickups colliding with each other. If that happens, we just check if each entity is an element of all pickups. If all pickups, and here we can use the exists method, exists passing in entity A, and all pickups dot exists entity B, then just return if that's true. Both entities are triggers and we do nothing. If one entity is a pickup and the other is a player, then that's where we need to flag some behavior. Again, this is very similar to what we just did. We just use all pickups and all players with their respective exists methods. In case one, entity A is a pickup and entity B is a player. In case two, it's the other way around. Unfortunately, there's no way of knowing ahead of time which one is entity A or entity B. Given the same set of data, we should get a consistent result, but we just don't know which one is which. So we need to prepare for both cases. Now, just for temp testing, let me use the Unity Engine debug log to print out a message. I'll just debug log the one entity has collided with the other and note which one is a pickup and which one is the player. So something like this, Unity Engine dot debug log, and then just put some descriptive message in there. We're using dot scripting and not mono behaviors, so you do need to specify Unity Engine or add a using line at the top. Then I'll just copy and paste this line and swap out entity A and entity B. Inside of these if statements is where you would add your functionality, but let's get it running first with the debug logs. But before we do that, we should make a couple of adjustments. We probably want our system to run after physics is complete to reduce any unnecessary lag. And what we can do is just scroll up to the top and take advantage of our system update order. Add an update after attribute. So update after type of, and just put in end frame physics system. So the logic in the script will run immediately after all of the physics is done calculating on this frame. The other issue is the burst compiler. We're using some stuff from the Unity engine and that only runs on the main thread. As such, I have to disable burst. So just comment this out. Burst doesn't run on the main thread, so that doesn't work here. And then down in the on update, I probably need to run complete on the job handle. This flushes the job from memory, returns ownership of the native containers back to the main thread, and basically makes things safe again. If you don't do that, you'll get an error. So job handle complete. If you do everything correctly, try it in play mode drive your spaceship over the item pickup trigger, and we should get a little debug statement in the console. It does spam many times per frame, so you will notice a little pause as you try to run your spaceship over the item pickup. That's okay, the log in the console isn't there to stay. If you check the entity debugger window, you should see that our entity IDs do in fact match the entity A and B from the log statement. In my case, entity five is the pickup and entity nine is the player. So that part is working, so that's good. Now, instead of logging a message to the console, what we wanna do is remove the item pickup. To do that, we need to use something that we haven't discussed before, and that's the entity command buffer. In dots, creating or destroying a component or creating or destroying an entity is considered a structural change something that requires rearrangement of how the data is stored in memory. Remember that everything is organized by archetype. Add or remove a component, add or remove an entity, and the data needs to be moved to a different chunk of memory. Anything triggering a structural change typically needs to be handled by the entity manager. And that's normally well and good, but we're using a job for our trigger event. And that means we don't have access to it. And that takes us to this entity command buffer. An entity command buffer, just as the name implies, is a buffer where you store commands. If there are certain actions that you can't run within a job, you can write them to a special area and then delay execution. When the job finishes, it can return ownership back to the main thread, and then these commands can run later. And that special area is the entity command buffer, or ECB. Dots gives us several places in the player loop each frame where we can create entity command buffers. If you look at the 
entity debugger. You'll remember that we have these systems labeled entity command buffer systems. You will typically use these to create and use the entity command buffers. Now you could create your own systems for doing this, but most of the time these existing systems should be enough. Every system group has one or two ECB systems, usually one at the beginning and one at the end. You can use those to generate and run the buffer commands. Let's start by choosing an ECB system. Now odds are good that I want to choose a system within the simulation system group since that's where most of the action takes place. My pickup on trigger system happens here. We've ordered it after the end frame physics system. So I think we're going to use this end simulation entity command buffer system. And at the top of pickup on trigger, let's define a private field. End simulation entity command buffer system, and let's call that command buffer system for short. And let's populate that in the onCreate method. I'll just use the world get or create system for that, just like we found the physics worlds we were using before. And basically that's our system. The buffer itself we're going to create within the job. Public entity command buffer, and we'll just call that entity command buffer for lack of a better name. And this is a struct. We can't initialize anything here, so we have to do that in the on update. Down here, we take the command buffer system and actually create the buffer with the create command buffer method. So to initialize that, job dot entity command buffer equals command buffer system dot create command buffer. Now, one more thing we can do while we're in on update. Job complete will work fine, but instead of that, I can simply do this. Command buffer system, add job handle for producer, and then we'll pass in the job handle as a dependency. So this just says that whatever you do in the buffer, run those commands when it's safe to do so. You don't necessarily need to wait for the entire job to complete, just when it's safe. Okay, so back in the struct, we can actually remove the item pickup. Let's get rid of the debug log statements or comment them out. And in our first if statement, the item pickup is entity A. So we just need to entity command buffer dot destroy entity, passing in entity A. You basically use the ECB the same way that you use the entity manager. When the time comes, whatever you've written into the buffer will execute properly. And then we just do the same thing for the else if clause, entity command buffer dot destroy entity, this time passing in entity B. And you can keep extending this logic for whatever item pickups you might want to create. And here is where you can check if there's some special behavior that you want to add. Do you want to give the player a special weapon? Do you want to restore some of their health points? You would just customize everything like that. In our case, I'm just going to remove the item pickup and I'll just leave it at that. Okay, let's save our script. Now at runtime, if I drive the player over the item pickup, then bam, the trigger event kicks in. The entity command buffer destroys the entity and we're done. Now I realize that's not terribly dramatic. Those of you who have been using on trigger enter in classic Unity may be like, why on earth do I need to do that just to trigger an event? And again, the answer comes down to flexibility and performance. For years, developers have complained about how restrictive PhysX has been in classic Unity. Now you can do a lot more with this system, but yes, unfortunately, it requires a lot more syntax to control it. Now, as the dots API gets more developed over time, this may get more streamlined, but that's how we currently do it at the moment. Now, once you have the system set up, like everything else in dots, you can scale up very quickly. It's the 40th anniversary of Pac-Man. So I thought I would just show you a lot more pickups. So there you go, spaceships eating dots. You can use this technique for trigger events to destroy enemy ships. You can destroy the player when you crash into something. You just have to set up the systems with the appropriate logic. So just remember to use that I trigger events job. Now for collisions where the physics entities actually bounce off each other instead of passing through, you just have to implement I collision events job instead of I trigger events job, as you might have guessed. And they're really similar if you know how to use one. The other is not really a whole lot different. But we'll have to see that some other time since we've far exceeded the length of this episode. Until then, just a reminder that you can check out our classic courses at gameacademy.school. Okay, well, thanks for watching as always. Until the next video, this is Wilmer. I'll see you in the Game Academy.